Alan is an internationally respected expert on business strategy, innovation, and unlocking the talent in people at all levels of your organization. In the past 20 years, he has helped over 300 teams and organizations with a 90% success rate. Also over lunch, he told me he has an unconditional guarantee. If you don't like what he did for you, you don't have to pay. Pretty interesting concept. He's also an award-winning teacher, author, and keynote speaker who has been called one of the most original thinkers in business today and, quote, unquote, the Robin Williams of business consulting. I want to hear a little bit more about that. Because <laughs> I love, anybody see Robin Williams when he was here in Baltimore a couple years ago? Nobody? Oh, my God, it was unbelievable. One guy tried to harass him from the audience. Oh, that guy. They had to carry him out. <laughs> I want to hear a little bit more about that. Alan's first book, Lessons from the Sandbox, provided a powerful formula for business and personal success based on the magic of childhood, lessons we learned from the sandbox when we were in first and second grade. His second book, Surrounded by Geniuses, the winner of the Axiom Award as a best leadership book, shows companies and organizations how to unlock more compelling value by finding powerful insight in their own people as well as the world around them. His newest book, The Necessity of Strangers, challenges the reader to make strangers really kind of wild. Strangers who might hold the key to innovation and your greater success. Make them an important part of your learning as well as your action. Very interesting concept. Everybody, please welcome Dr. Alan Gregerman. Thank you, Doug. Greetings. I'll be at the mic some of the time. If I step over here, can you still hear me back there? Perfect. Uh, do we have a wireless mic? Then we'll talk really loud then, or I'll try and keep coming back here if I can, if I remember that. The, uh, so it's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. I'm delighted when I kind of reconnected with Doug to talk about the possibility of sharing ideas with all of you because I realize that this is a kind of great venue with people who are entrepreneurial and thinking about new and better ways to run your businesses and more importantly new and better ways to deliver the most compelling value to the customers you have the privilege to serve. Um, I like to talk about customers in that term that we actually have the privilege to serve people and I like for all of our folks and all of the partners we work with to be totally focused on that um, because I think it is a privilege to have customers. In fact, it would be hard to run a business without customers. And I think it's a privilege to be inspired by customers to figure out how to do things that matter more to them this year than we mattered to them last year. And that really means that we have to be more innovative consistently, that we have to bring new ideas, new products, new services, new customer experiences, new ways to make their lives or their businesses' lives more successful. And so I think we ought to wake up every morning thinking about the fact that we ought to be energized about doing that because that's the exciting part of being in business. Now, I'm going to share with you today some ideas that I've been working on over the last few years that are now incorporated um, in my newest book, and it's called The Necessity of Strangers. Um, and we're, kind of, we're lucky enough to have folks from Barnes & Noble who are here who would be delighted to sell you a copy, and I would be honored uh, to sign a copy for you. I'd also be honored to sign copies for anyone who's still on your Christmas list uh, or holiday list. Um, and I got to say it's way better than like a fruit basket or any of the other things, you know, a dozen crab cakes, which are significantly high in cholesterol. Um, so it's way better than any of those things. Uh, and the book actually comes with, the publisher won't do this, the book comes with an unconditional guarantee of satisfaction. If you buy it, you don't find value in it. Um, you can simply send it back to me and I will refund your money. I want to know why you didn't find value. So in my next book, you know, you'll like. But, um, but I'll definitely refund your money. I'd also like you to think about not only buying it, but I'd love for you all, once you buy it, to read it in an area of high visibility. Um, and so you can think about to the extent that you travel, you know, the airport lounges that you go in, 
if you're part of other prestigious clubs, to the extent that you're going to many holiday parties that haven't yet happened, um, it would be novel but not unusual to bring a book to a holiday party. Um, and at the moments when the party doesn't seem as exciting or robust or you've just run out of energy to sit and learn a few new things with the book held like this actually is pretty good, I think, because it might inspire people uh, to say, is that an interesting book? And even if you've just gotten the, through a few pages of it, feel free to say that it's a remarkably interesting book. Um, you don't have to say it's the best book you've ever written, but you could say it's the best book I've ever started, at least, um, just as a way to get people kind of excited and engaged. So um, the idea to it, I think, is fundamental to all of your success, and I think it's particularly fundamental to your success for a couple of reasons. The first is, how many of you ever, as a child, were told not to talk to strangers? Any of you? Um, and if not, I'd simply have to say bad parenting. Um, because the reality is there probably are some folks out there who are a bit dangerous. But we're all kind of conditioned, either uh, when we were kids or telling our children that strangers are kind of to be avoided. Just hang out with people you know. Um, we also live in a world in which friends really matter. So how many of you are on Facebook? How many of you would consider yourself power Facebook users? You're kind of checking it pretty regularly. None of you? Well, you should. OK, but anyway. Um, and uh, so we, we live in a world in which friends are kind of everything, and we're told it's kind of who you know that matters. How many of you are using LinkedIn? And you find, even with its frustrations, to be an invaluable source of data for yourselves, okay? So you're kind of mining LinkedIn to see who you know and how you could accumulate as big a set of kind of LinkedIn contacts as possible. How many of you have 500 LinkedIn contacts? Any of you have 1,000 or more? Any of you have more than 1,500? Good for you. OK. You've, and you know all of these people really well, don't you, Bob? <laughs> the, um, and yet the notion that we have in our society is it's who you know that matters. We're told to go to the best schools. Um, where su it suggested to us we live in the right neighborhoods. We join the right companies. We hang out with the people who are going to be most influential to us. Well, in reality, even if you're like Bob and you have 1,500 LinkedIn contacts, there are at last count roughly 7.1 billion people on Earth. So even Bob, our most connected person in this room, has an infinitesimal fraction of relationships when it comes to all the people on Earth you could know. I would argue that actually whom you could know matters way more than whom you know. And I'd also argue that because generally most of your friends, bless their hearts, are a lot like you. They do roughly the same thing as you. They have roughly the same education level as you. They live roughly in the same kind of neighborhood as you. They drive roughly the same kind of car as you. They support roughly the same kind of ravens that you do. Um, they have a lot of similar interests to you. We tend to hang out with people who are a lot like us. And so when it comes time to do something really remarkable and different than I've done before, we tend to ask people who are an awful lot like us to help us. That's kind of an odd thing. So I want to break out of the mold, and so let's hire or bring in a lot of very similar people. So imagine your company when you've got to come up with a remarkable idea. You've got to be better at a new product or a new service. You've got to create a better customer experience. You've got to figure out how to make the web work better. You've got to use technology in new ways. You've got to figure out how to hire a new generation of folks for whom the average tenure, anybody want to guess what the average tenure in a workplace is for somebody in their early 20s in America? Two years, three, six months? Well, that's a little bit harsh, but it's, but it's 51 weeks. 51 weeks. So remember when you were starting your career, and probably for some of you, you were told, you know, you've got to have some longevity on your resume. Remember that? you really got to hang in there. You can't change jobs all that often. And so some of you may have been with roughly the same company for a long time, but you were kind of told, you know, you want to stay in there three to five years. And then it was like two years. Well, now, God, if you've been somewhere a year, that's like looking like you really made a commitment to those people. Um, 
But so in a world in which folks are staying 51 weeks, we have a challenge if we don't figure out how to engage them. Um, and so, so let's say you have any of these challenges, so now you've got to figure out how to be creative. So now you, the head or a senior person in your organization, get your team of people together, folks kind of like you. And I'm assuming over there that you're, tweet, you're tweeting, right, about this talk? Okay, good. And, uh, and uh, so you get everybody together, and then at the appointed moment, you turn to everybody and you say, okay, our backs are to the wall. Does anyone here have an out-of-the-box idea? Anybody ever uttered those words? I mean, it's humiliating, but go ahead, admit it. Okay, and so, so you utter that, and then all of a sudden, as though the heavens broke, and God, him or herself, uttered those words, then everybody goes, oh, God, yes, I have a million out-of-the-box ideas. Does it ever work that way? Does it ever happen? You ask all the same smart people who work in your company who all think exactly alike because that's what companies do. We make everybody think the same way. Um, if they have an out-of-the-box idea and they actually don't, and instead they say, well, you know, I have the same tired, lame ideas we've always had in these meetings. But if you want me to come up with an out-of-the-box idea, I think I need to figure out how to think differently. And so it really doesn't happen. But there's a simple way, actually, to change the equation. And that is at that moment when you're compelled to ask all of your colleagues if they have an out-of-the-box idea. In the confines of your most remarkable meeting room, you say, here's what we're going to do. I don't expect any of you right now to have a totally new idea. I mean, you're all brilliant, you're all wonderful, but you all know what you already know, and I know kind of roughly what you know. So here's what I'm asking all of us to do. We're all going to go and wander around Baltimore for the next day. You're just going to leave. You're going to get out of the building. You're going to wander around the city. You're going to go anywhere in the city where you think they do something remarkable to a business you think is remarkable or a nonprofit you think is remarkable or to the art museum, which is remarkable or you're going to go to a performance of the symphony orchestra, or you're going to go to the Maryland Institute of Fine Arts. You're going to go someplace where somebody does something remarkable, and you're going to hang out with them and ask them what they do that's remarkable and what's their secret to success. And then we're all going to come back and share what we've discovered, remarkable ideas from a world filled with strangers. And we're going to combine the best of those ideas with the best of what we already know. And suddenly in that room where we ask for innovative ideas, people will be filled with innovative ideas. They'll be energized in ways that you never imagined, simply by asking them to leave the building. Because what they'll suddenly see is, as opposed to simply making connections with what we already know, we now have all these other ideas and inspirations, which combined with what we know actually stirs the pot and challenges us to think in different ways. And in a few moments, I'll share with you some ideas that you and your folks can discover just all around us, which will dramatically change the course of almost any business that you could be in. But first, the power of strangers is simply the notion that we can't know it all and that the folks who win in business are the folks who are humble about the fact that we can only know so much, and that's okay. That's actually pretty cool and that the things we don't know become gaps that are worth filling by finding somebody in the world around us who can help us to be much smarter. I had this awesome experience, well, I don't know if it was an awesome experience, in which I was invited many, many years ago by one of the 20 largest regional banks in America. It was a bank at the time called First Union Bank, and they were based in Philadelphia. Um, and they invited me to come up to help them figure out how to improve customer service because of the 20 largest banks in the United States, they were rated last in terms of customer service. And that was not helping their business. Um, so I arrived there and they said, someone's told us you're really a fairly clever person. Are we, is this? <coughs> that. Okay, good. Uh, 
So they invited me in. They said, you're, we've heard you're a clever guy. We want to be really better at customer service, and we've heard you can help us. And I said, that's awesome. I'm delighted to be here. I said, and the good thing is you're at the bottom, so the only way is up. Um, to which they said, in anticipation of you arriving, we've, we've done something which is really cool, and the CEO placed in front of me a study. And he said, yes, we've already spent $2 million on a study by the McKinsey Company to study the customer service practices of the leading banks in America. To which I looked at the cover of that, and I quickly factored that he'd said $2 million, and I started laughing. Not a good move as a consultant trying to win a project, but, you know. And he said, you're laughing because this is good. And I said, no, unlike most people, I guess, I laugh when things are funny. <laughs> to which he said, oh, so what's so funny about this? And I said, well, just let me ask you a question, and maybe, you know, this will be a short meeting. I said, are banks renowned for providing a high level of customer service? And he said, well, no. And I said, so that's awesome. So you just spent $2 million to figure out how to be the best of the worst. Does that seem funny to you? And he said, well, if I hadn't spent $2 million, it would have seemed pretty darn funny. So then they said, what should we have done? And I said, well, you know, are there any folks in Philadelphia who are really good at customer service? And he said, well, yeah. And I said, so let's just name them just for fun, um, keeping the funny theme there. And so I said, you know, you have the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. Those people have a rough idea how to actually get their customers to like them. And you have the Four Seasons Hotel if you'd rather be treated well by Canadians than Americans. <laughs> so, and then, and I said, and there's this store I've heard of called Nordstrom's, okay? And there's reason to believe that they go out of their way to treat people really nicely. And then I mentioned a few other businesses, including one of my favorites, um, the folks at L.L. Bean, the place where I got my notion of the unconditional guarantee of satisfaction. So they guarantee. So they guarantee, is it, do we have to, they guarantee these things, you know, and I guarantee consulting services. It's a little bit more of a crapshoot because um, I know how to make a booth that works. But, um, and so I said, what if we actually, oh, this is not, do I have to do something or, I'll, I'll hang out. Is there, push the, is there a, there, but uh, how about this? I'll stand here. I'll bring the toys here. Okay. So, um, so I actually took them to all these places to explore brilliance in action, and their folks were significantly inspired. And we came up with a plan for reinventing banking, um, a plan that involved being open seven days a week. How many of you here are bankers? Any of you? Okay, and you would of course want to be open seven days a week. Okay, uh, which was, I saw it as a kind of a cool thing. It ran counter to the way their banks operated. Their banks were generally open the hours that customers couldn't get there, um, which I thought was kind of an exciting thing. They'd created a model in which they didn't want to interact with customers, and the customers understood that. Um, the greatest innovation of First Union Bank, I should mention, because they were not without kind of assets, is they were the prime driver of the ATM. Um, they were, the, they were the prime mover and investor in creating ATMs, a way to do banking without having to deal with a banker. Um, so it was kind of an interesting idea. But we came up with all these ideas, open seven days a week, open late at night, um, open, uh, have concierges at the bank branches, have different types of expertise, start to provide education to the children of all your customers so they would have financial literacy um, as a core component of what they did. Really cool ideas. It went to the board, and the board said, we can't do this. It's not like banking. Okay? Ideas from strangers just weren't like banking. Um, to my kind of good or amusing fortune, a person who was in the room decided to leave and hook up with a guy named Vernon Hill, who started a bank called Commerce Bank. They're now TD Bank because Vernon had some, Vernon had some other business issues that kind of stalled his career, but if you ever experienced Commerce Bank, these were the folks who reinvented banking. These were the folks who actually used all of these ideas. These were the folks who were open seven days a week, um, and I love the example of the deli and being open there, because one of the ideas that was developed um, at Commerce Bank was um, that you would say that you were open from seven in the morning till eight at night, but you would be open till 8, 10 at night. But on the wall it said, or on the door it said, open till 8 at night. And then what would happen is, how many of you have ever been racing late to get to the bank or someplace, 
and get really frustrated. You know, you get there, you check your watch, you see that the door is locked, you see an employee in there, you wave to them, they wave back to you, you point to the doorknob, they point to their watch as though you're pathetic because what are you, a customer? And then, and then they point and say you can come back the next day. So at Commerce Bank, what was decided was that it would say 8 o'clock, so the people racing to get there um, would think, oh my God, I'm going to miss the bank. And then up till 8.10, a Commerce Bank employee from 8 o'clock to 8.10 would stand at the door. And when somebody came, as opposed to saying you can't come in, would hold the door open and say, hey, slow down, it's okay. We waited for you. Was that like a compelling idea? It's like an awesome idea. It was an unbanking idea, but it should be an idea that all of us have. I mean, how many of you will close your doors a la the deli if you know that a customer needs you? How many of you here are in business and wouldn't take a cell phone call at all hours of the day or night? You know, we tell our customers, I give all of our customers um, my cell phone number, my home phone number, in the event that for some reason Sprint is not on my team that day. And, um, and then I say, hey, if it's important to you, you can call me whenever. You can call me, you know, um, the middle of the night, I'm there for you. How many times in 25 years of business have I gotten a call in the middle of the night? Three times. Was it really important? Did they have a huge crisis? It was amazingly important to them. Um, did the fact that I took their call make them believe that they should keep doing business with me forever? Absolutely, because who else would have done that? But so, but so the power of being open to the ideas of others, I think, is a vital idea. Now let me share one simple fact. 99% of all new ideas are based on the insight of someone else or something else. So it's interesting. If almost every new idea that's ever occurred is based on somebody else's insight, why wouldn't we, when we're trying to develop new ideas, why wouldn't we go out there and search for insight? It just makes sense. Innovation doesn't occur the way we typically behave. Innovation occurs when we get out there and engage with folks with new ideas. So imagine this. It's 1939, and a remarkable guy, a Russian immigrant to the United States named Igor Sikorsky, is about to launch the first commercially viable helicopter. This one's about to take off. And so he creates the VS-300 after a lifetime of imagining how to make a helicopter. As a child in Russia, he had thought that vertical flight was the coolest thing ever. And I don't know, as a child, I thought helicopters were amazing. Um, and he always dreamed of the ability to create a helicopter, even though no helicopters existed at the time. Well, not in the sense that he was thinking about it. He spent his entire life of working in the aviation industry on traditional airplanes trying to create the opportunity and trying to get smart enough to actually design and create a helicopter. He was a brilliant guy. Um, but I would argue that his brilliance was tied to his commitment to learning from 2,000 years of strangers and that he never would have had a passion for vertical flight or ever created a helicopter without thinking about that. What truly drove him initially as a child was a 2,000-year-old toy. called the Chinese Top. And it was an amazing toy that had been invented and was one of the most popular toys that appeared in the marketplaces of Europe when he was growing up. He understood that. He imagined that he could do that for humans. Then he learned about a guy named Leonardo da Vinci. Really smart guy. Pictures of helicopters 450 years ago. Did he invent them himself? No. Did he see helicopters in action every day? In fact, he did, because from his, bal oh, from his balcony in Florence, he regularly saw dragonflies, amazing creatures who had the uncanny ability to go straight up, go straight forward, go straight down on a lily pad, find something to eat, go straight up, and then go backwards as fast as they could go forward, something a modern helicopter can't even do. Da Vinci saw in nature even more inspiration than anything he could have conceived. 
and he sought to figure out how to take those ideas and turn them into something remarkable. He never created a flying helicopter, and his design was kind of funky. It involved six people basically kind of kind of twisting cranks to get something to actually lift up in the air. But he was imagining it. And then from there to Sikorsky were several hundred years of people testing, making model helicopters, and getting things to start to fly for a few moments. Sikorsky was a student of these people. He relied on strangers to make him successful. Even the most remarkably successful and innovative companies rely on the insight and genius of other folks. How many of you use a portable music player? Any of you? Like an iPod or, okay? How many of you have an Apple portable music player? Now it's interesting, we tend to think these folks really invented the iPod and made entertainment portable, but that's not the case at all. Let me share with you the true story. In 1979, and as I walk across the Diag at the University of Michigan, I am the coolest person on the planet. Because unlike anybody else, I have entertainment that's portable. I am the proud possessor of a Sony Walkman. The most amazing piece of technology of its time. Because the folks at Sony, a brilliant company, figured out how to make entertainment portable. They literally figured that out. So I was literally a party waiting to happen. Okay? Anywhere I went, I brought my own music. I could give somebody an earphone. If I could attach a speaker to it, you know, music would happen. And I could do that, young people will be amused, in multiples of 12 songs. Isn't that awesome? I just put a cassette in there. So this is really good. This is Pink Floyd here, actually. So this is really good. Um, how many of you have Sony portable music players today? They sold half a billion of these things. They literally own the ears of the world. And yet somehow they dropped the ball. But they invented portable music. So Apple didn't invent portable music. They just figured out how to make it more compelling. Um, they didn't even invent the technology that goes into these Apple devices. And I am the proud possessor. I guess I have personally like seven different Apple devices. So I have bought into it. I think they're brilliant. But I also realized that they leverage other folks' ideas. So the fundamental technology platform of these is MP3 technology, okay? Did Apple invent that? No. Nope. Two German engineers in 1986. And I would even argue that the ecosystem that allows the iPod to be so remarkable, and that ecosystem is really the iTunes store, the largest single repository of content on Earth, is a 2,300-year-old idea. It's a total knockoff from the Egyptians. 2,300 years ago, the Egyptians created the Great Library in Alexandria, Egypt, by far the world's largest repository of content anywhere. 400,000 documents. What the Egyptians believed was close to the sum total of human knowledge at that time. They didn't realize there were people in lots of other places, but they'd accumulated that. They had a pretty bad music collection, but they accumulated all of this knowledge, all parchment documents. The folks at Apple simply thought, God, if it was a good idea 2,300 years ago, it must be a darn good idea now, and we can digitize. So today, instead of this, I go running with this. This had 12 songs. This has 3,200 songs on it. Kind of a different thing. They made it more powerful they made it more user-friendly, they put amazing design and intuition into it, but they built on other people's ideas. In the absence of all these other folks, they'd be nothing. You can be the same way. You can build your next idea on the brilliance of other folks. The challenge is, are you open to doing that? Any of you in the medical profession here? Okay. Well, you all go to doctors or no doctors. We're in the city that has among the world's <coughs> finest doctors. So here's a fascinating thing. The most commonly used medical diagnostic device worldwide is the stethoscope, a very simple device used to listen to heart and listen for irregular lung sounds. Very common device invented in 1811 
by a French surgeon. It remained in almost exactly the same form for 198 years, basically doing roughly the same thing. And then some clever folks at 3M and Littman decided that maybe in a world filled with digital technology, this guy could use a total home makeover. And so they took a microcomputer, attached it to a stethoscope, put a little bit of remarkable software in there, and then suddenly enabled primary care medical professionals in a remote village in Bolivia or India or Asia or even a hard to reach place possibly in the mountains of the United States to be able to listen to the heart or the lungs of a child, be able to push a button, take a picture, and then digitally send with analysis an image and an understanding of what was going on in their heart. Simply by taking an idea that had existed forever and a new idea and putting the two together. That image could be sent to a major medical center in a big city and a doctor could look and see whether or not that child needed to be brought in for a medical <coughs> procedure. All because somebody dared to look at something so common and think that it could be amazing. We have the ability to look at all of the stuff we do that over time becomes common <coughs> and make it amazing. You have the ability with every single thing you offer to figure out what's the way I make it more remarkable. Any of you here like to repair things? And the rest of you like to pay too much to have them repaired, right? <laughs> okay, so that's a problem. So the world of do-it-yourselfers is kind of declining. So if I sold parts that would enable somebody to repair something and they don't really want to repair it, that's a tough business. There are a hundred companies roughly in America that sell online appliance parts. There's one that shines way above them. And it's a company that figured out how to combine what they knew, distributing appliance parts, with what a new generation knows, social media. It's called repairclinic.com. This is the new carburetor for my Honda lawnmower. I will put it in when the weather gets a little bit warmer. Um, it's actually interesting to bring as a prop because the folks at TSA are always curious since none of them know what a carburetor is. Is that a weapon? <laughs> no, it's not. What do you use it for? To run a lawnmower. Where's the lawnmower? <laughs> What's in my large carry-on? <laughs> 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 And so what do they do at repairclinic.com to make them so successful? They have a robust website. They have reasonable prices that are not the lowest. They're somewhere in the middle. But every time I buy an appliance part, it comes with a piece of paper. And that piece of paper says, go to video number 107 on the repairclinic.com YouTube channel. And on that channel are 1,300 videos of any appliance part you could repair done by people who look just like all of you, the folks who refuse to repair your own appliances. So they look like you guys. And then what do they have on there? They have six minute videos that walk you through how to do it. You put it on your iPad, you put it on your phone, you get behind the ice maker, you kind of turn off the power, always do that, always turn off the power. And then you follow this and you repair something. And at the end of it, you go, God, I repaired it myself. I'm amazing, okay? because they built amazing self-esteem on your part. What have they done? They took an old distribution business with relatively old dated technology and they added a more dynamic kind of YouTube social media presence than most technology companies have. And they're booming. They get hundreds of thousands of sales and hits every month because they revolutionized the world of what it meant to do things yourself. And if you get stuck with the video, you can simply call an 800 number there, and that 800 number is the repair guru. So if you're like a pathetic do-it-yourselfer, then they're there for you. Because they know if you can do it, they can grow their business. It's a really kind of simple thing, okay? So you guys next will get the folks that you're giving cars to to be part of fixing their cars. Don't you think? And I've got an idea for how you can make that happen. We'll talk later about it. Okay, so... But so they understand that. But it's being open to a world of strangers. Any of you recall fondly in 2010 participating in the United States Census? Any of you? 
Okay? And did you get a census taker came to your house? Or did you just fill in the form? Anybody actually have a real census taker come to their house? Okay, you did. Fortunately, they didn't skip Baltimore. Okay. Okay, good. And do, if you recall, the census taker, did they ask you a few questions? Yeah. And they had a pad of paper. They had, a, they had like a clipboard. And then they had a pencil. And then they wrote your answers down. Mm -hmm. And did you think for a moment, God, this is 2010. Why are they using the same technology they used in 1790 when the first census occurred? They had quill pens then, okay? Well, they didn't intend to do that, though it's nice when some things never change. They intended to do it by having handheld, digital, remarkable census-taking devices. But they let out a contract for $640 million. How many of you are taxpayers here? Any of you? <laughs> okay. Um, $640 million, but when it was time to go with this, it didn't work. So they scrapped that, okay? <coughs> the contract was let by George Bush. Because it was a long-term contract, okay? So we can't pass judgment on the skill of anyone who runs the federal government. Okay, but so anyway, they let this contract. They ended up spending another $3.2 billion to do it all by hand. It was awesome. So I met that CIO of the Census Bureau shortly after this decision was made, and we were talking, and he was lamenting the challenge of making these big investments and how difficult it is. And we're now seeing with the Affordable Care Act, it's not quite working out well. But in the case of the Census Bureau, he said, you know, it's a shame it worked out that way, and I said it didn't have to be that way. And he said, what do you mean? I said, this was like a free problem to solve. And he said, what do you mean by that? And I said, have you ever noticed when you go to work every day, really stylish brown trucks filled with really stylish people wearing brown clothes? He goes, you mean the UPS people? I said, exactly. I said, have you ever noticed when they came into your office what they do? He said, you mean deliver packages? I said, exactly. And he said, I, and I said, did you ever notice what they held in their hands when they were delivering packages? And he said, you mean a handheld computer? I said, exactly. And so I said, did it ever dawn on you when you saw these people every day and you were about to procure a handheld computer that you might ask them if you could borrow theirs? He said, never. <laughs> and I said, but they actually had a handheld computer and my guess is it had every address in America because that's their business. And I bet it had a lot of functionality. And I bet if you'd asked them if you could have borrowed it, or if they teach you how to do it, it would have been in their vested interest to be nice to the United States government. He said, probably exactly. And I said, sometimes innovation comes right to us. We just have to open our eyes. And I would argue it comes to all of us if we open our eyes. I'd also argue that each and every one of you, each day, walk by at least a hundred people, places, or things that could change your business life. People or places that know something that you could know that would make your business better. But in your haste to get to that important meeting, in your haste to not interrupt your routine, you never look up. You never imagine that the sign in the window could be a brilliant idea for you, that the person walking down the street could be a remarkable person to know, that the event you go to could be the door opening to connecting with someone with a remarkable idea, that the time you spend to connect with strangers online in another country with a different business practice might challenge the way we do things. So imagine this as we debate an imperfect change to a really imperfect healthcare system, there are countries in the world that have really good healthcare systems. Did we ever pause for a moment to ask them what they did that we might emulate? Did one ever imagine, even though we call them a socialist country, that the folks in Sweden have a higher level of health care, that they live seven years longer than us, and that they spend 40% of what we spend per capita on health care. Might we have wanted to ask them if they could have shared some ideas instead of doing our half-baked political process of what we do? 
So in almost anything that matters, there's the possibility that somebody knows something we don't know. But we gotta be open to doing it. Just in terms of wandering around here, there are all kinds of cool ideas that I think ought to inspire you, but you never imagine that you could get insight from them. Any of you ever shopped at Ikea? Okay? <coughs> and how many of you really enjoy Ikea? Okay, so you know, you know, the, Ikea is right at White Marsh, so it's not that hard to get to, okay? So if you've ever been to Ikea, Ikea is a pretty awesome place. What's Ikea's business? Cheap and nice looking furniture, okay? Low cost furniture that kind of looks good as cool Scandinavian style. So they have a catalog, and the catalog's amazing, and then they have a store which once you enter, it's impossible to leave, okay? <laughs> so once you start walking on the path at Ikea, you're condemned to walk by all 10,000 products they sell. And in the process, you wear one of these bags because they know at Ikea that you're likely to spend $100 more than you ever intended to buy on stuff you really have no need for. In fact, people's closets are filled with stuff they bought at Ikea that they've never put up, okay? And then, as you're walking through Ikea, so Ikea, you notice, are giant blue buildings with yellow letters, those are the national colors of Sweden. Okay, you guys know that, you're very astute. You know geography, okay, good. And the Ikea employees wear bright blue and yellow clothes. I used to think, um, that it was because those were the national colors of Sweden. Now I know the reason they wear those clothes is so they'll know who else in the store they're allowed to talk to, each other. Because they certainly don't want to talk to customers there. It's not part of the IKEA business model. The IKEA business model is it's all about you. You find it, you rope it to the ground, you wrestle it to the ground, you drag it out of the store, you go through the self-checkout, because they don't they didn't want to talk to you in the store. Why do they want to talk to you? Okay? And then you get out to your car and you go, oh my god, it doesn't fit. But that's okay. The folks at IKEA have you covered because they have cardboard roof racks that you can use and string. They have no instruction on how to tie a knot, but they have cardboard roof racks and string. So now you get it all up on the top of your car. You tie it up there, and then if you ever see anybody driving away from Ikea with boxes on their car, don't drive behind them, okay? <laughs> so now you get it home, and you pull, you open it up, and you see instructions that have no words. They're so cheap, they won't even give you words on the instructions. Instead, they have like a guy with like a kind of funny head, and he's pointing through every step of the process. They would claim they do that because they sell in 47 different countries, and they figure it just doesn't make sense to have all these words and gibberish on there, you can figure it out, you're smart. <coughs> you're a do-it-yourself. And then you pull out a little wrench called an Allen wrench. I used to think they named it after me. Uh, turns out they spelled it wrong. And you put it together. And then you're so excited because your place looks gorgeous. You call all your friends, you're gonna have a party. The friends come over and they come in and they go, oh my God, gorgeous new furniture. And you go, wait, don't sit in it. I bought it at Ikea. <laughs> But the challenge of Ikea is that what they know matters to all of us. Bless you. Should matter to all of us. In a world in which how many of you feel at times in business that your customers are regularly saying, I expect more from you and I'd like to pay less? Anybody ever heard that from a customer? Anybody not heard that from a customer? So the reality is we live in a world in which customers have higher expectations and lower budgets. Ikea has the solution for that. You make the customer do part of it themselves, and you make them love doing part of it themselves. Ikea's wisdom is this. You focus on the stuff that only you can do in the work that you do, and you make the customer smart enough to do more and more of it on their own through robust web portals, through dynamic videos and instruction, through training that you give them, is you literally empower them to be more bought into your solution more capable of doing stuff so that the money they have to spend, they'll spend on you because you've delivered so much expertise. So the folks at Ikea, as painful as it is, are teaching us all something about what the future of business is all about. Now on the other end, how many of you have ever shopped at Whole Foods Market? Any of you? Come on, you're successful, you should shop there, come on. <laughs> And for those of you who do, you do it because you like to spend twice as much for groceries as you should, right? <laughs> you, 
you like the thought that you can spend a lot of money and it's not that heavy to carry. That you don't have to take that much from the store. Well, the folks at Whole Foods, I think, are pretty darn brilliant. $12 billion company. They, they kind of revolutionized the world of grocery shopping through the notion of natural and organic food and natural and organic personal care products. They've created an amazing brand um, that's an awesome place, I think, to shop. And I'd argue that their stuff costs a bit more, to the extent that a lot of it is fresh. The sourcing is a bit more expensive. It's got to be more local. There's a lot more transportation involved. But I'd also argue that they do some things that create a remarkable customer experience that all of you ought to be doing. And you'd learn that if you went to Whole Foods and instead of just buying an overpriced item, paid attention to what they did. What do I have to do to get people to want to buy all this stuff? I got to convince them it's better for them. I got to convince them and make them smarter about the stuff they put in their body or on their body. I got to get them to buy into the power of natural and organic. So how do I do that? I provide lots of material. If you go to a typical Whole Foods, there's an amazing amount of printed material. Just walk around sometime and grab the brochures. What does it mean to be gluten-free? How do you have a vegetarian diet? How do you cook with tofu? How do you do all these other things? What things should be in personal care products? Is methyl mercury good for you? Okay, how many people think it is? Unless you're part tuna, it actually is not. And so the challenge is that they're trying to make you smarter about all this stuff. But it doesn't stop there. They offer classes two or three nights a week in every Whole Foods to make you smarter. And they've also given a lot of knowledge to all their employees. So let's say you're at the Safeway and you need to buy a product, okay? So let's say you ask somebody at Safeway or Food Lion or whatever where something is. So let's pick prune juice, okay? You ask them where's the prune juice. They're likely to say, God, I don't know, or the giant. Uh, aisle 24, just go west, just go west. And then when you go west, just turn in there and it'll work out for you. You ask anyone at Whole Foods where a product is, they're required to take you there. And when they take you there, they're required to ask you if you have any questions. Yeah, prune juice doesn't work. <laughs> And then, if, you do, if they don't know the answer, they're required to find a coworker who knows the answer. And they're required to bring them to you or tell you, you keep shopping, we'll find you. Is that a cool idea? It's a notion in business we call sticking with the customer. That as soon as a customer engages us, we don't stop until their need is met. Runs counter to the way most businesses run. So what if you have the power to do that? What if you wouldn't let a customer get off the phone or out of a meeting till you solved their problem? Or till you made a commitment that by the end of the day, you'd get the best answer in the world to them based on talking to all your colleagues. You'd change the equation. What if a key theme in your business was, the smarter I make the customers, the more successful we'll be? It used to be when we ran a business where we believed we had a lot of expertise, the notion we had was, I keep the expertise and the customer pays for it. The notion we ought to have is the smarter I make the customer, the more they'll actually ask me to do stuff for them. But I don't know that all of us get that. So I'd hang out at a Whole Foods with all of my folks and say, let's figure out why these guys make folks so smart, and then let's figure out what we can do based on what they do that makes all of our customers compellingly smarter. You truly win in that business. So there's so many ideas that are all around you. Anybody ever bought anything from LLB? <coughs> Okay, and you generally have had a good experience with L.L. Bean? It's hard not to have a good experience because every single thing they sell is unconditionally guaranteed. From a boot to a fishing rod to a bicycle, if at any time you don't believe it's delivered value commensurate with what you paid for it, you can give it back to them and they'll either refund your money or they'll give you a new one. So I took a team of people to the L.L. Bean call center in Freeport, Maine, and I just wanted them to hear what happens when we always agree with the customer. That's kind of a weird thing, when we always think the customer is right. And so a call came in which was absurdly cool. A woman calls and says, I bought an umbrella from L.L. Bean 15 years ago, and it broke. <laughs> Anybody ever had an umbrella that broke? In a lot less than 15 years, okay? In fact, most of us decide it's going to break. Why buy a good umbrella? And she said, I bought it and it broke. And before she could say, like, can you do anything for me, the person said, we apologize for our umbrella not living up to your expectations. Oh. Albeit unreasonable expectations, <laughs> but they didn't live up to her expectations. And that was not fine with the company. To 
which the person said, if you can describe your umbrella, I don't believe we carry 15-year-old umbrellas anymore, but if you can describe it to me, I will send you our best umbrella that we sell today that's as close to yours as possible. To which the woman said, and what will it cost me? And the LLB person said, absolutely nothing. To which then the LLB person had the audacity to say, is it likely to rain where you are tomorrow? To which the person said, I think it's going to rain the whole week. She said, don't worry, I'll overnight it to you. To which the person said, what's that going to cost me? Absolutely nothing. It's our pleasure. And then she ended the call by saying, I apologize for the product not living up to your expectations. I hope you realize you can always count on us. And that if anything ever happens with another product, simply give us a call. What do the folks at LLB know? They know that roughly 1% of customers are unreasonable human beings. You know, they're probably not dangerous, but they're unreasonable human beings. <laughs> it's more people are dangerous. No, but seriously. So they're unreasonable human beings. But if the cost of doing business is to guarantee everything we offer to a world in which 99% of people are reasonable human beings, that's an awfully good business model to have. Because all of them will tell every one of their friends that this umbrella got replaced, or that this fishing rod got replaced, even though I had no idea how to use it, I broke it, but they replaced it for me. That's the power of that idea. So I'd like to again challenge you with another idea. What do you guarantee? What could you guarantee in your business that would change the equation? A result that matters to the customer that would suddenly get them to think you're way different than all the other folks who they see in a sea of commodities, in a sea of pretty darn similar services. You have the power to do that simply by imagining what the folks at LLB know. So literally the world is filled with powerful ideas. Your challenge is to think about how to unlock them. I had an awesome project in which a retail, leading women's retail company, um, which had bad kind of, kind of customer ratings, asked me if I could help them rethink their customer experience. And I said, that'll be great. Here's what we'll do. I want you and your team to meet me. And if you're familiar with DC, I said, meet me at 3000 Connecticut Avenue at 6 o'clock on a Tuesday morning. And they said, isn't that a little bit early? I said, for what we're going to learn, that's a great time to know. Because that's when it's going to start to be light out. So they said, that's okay. And I said, there's a metro stop. It ought to be pretty easy. Just meet me there. If you need coffee, that's great. And then we'll get about thinking in a new way. So the whole team arrived there, and I was standing there smiling and waiting for them with clipboards, and they looked up and there was a big sign that said, welcome to the National Zoo, okay? So they said, so and we're here because, and I said, we're here because we need some fresh ideas, and these are the folks in here who are going to provide them to us. They said, excuse me? And a few said, there's not enough coffee in the world to do this. And I said, just bear with me. I said, here's what we're going to do for the next two hours. We've arrived at a time when most of the animals are waking up. They're going to exhibit lots of interesting behaviors. Some of those behaviors are going to be remarkable in a good way. Some of those behaviors are going to be remarkable in not such a good way. I want you to go around the zoo with your clipboards and write down every time you see an animal do something that you think is really cool in terms of how it interacts with people or interacts with another animal. And I want you to write down all the times you see animals doing things that you think are pretty darn offensive. Um, and that no animal should do that, and certainly no human being. They did that, and at the end of two hours, we all gathered, and I said, was that the worst thing you've ever done? And they said, no, that was actually really awesome. In fact, I noticed a lot of our behaviors here in the zoo. <laughs> and I said, exactly. And I said, and did you notice some better behaviors here in the zoo? And they said, actually, we noticed some really cool behaviors, from animals singing to wake up and tell other people, to animals coming over and getting, making sure that their other animals that they hung out with were really comfortable with them. You can't leave. Wait a minute. You're, we saw you. <laughs> the, uh, and, um, and what we did based on that was came up with, in a fun and engaging way, a way to get all of their people to think differently about how they engage customers based on animal behaviors, based on the reality that they were being bad animals and they needed to be better, and that there were some insights. And we dramatically changed the way they thought about engaging folks, and the way they thought about reading the customers, and seeing which customers they ought to stand back from, and which customers they ought to engage more fully. And we changed the equation, using that as a starting point. Now, we also looked at the best practices of leading customer service providers. 
but the thing that really energized them was to get them out of the office and think about how these strangers could impact the world that they engaged in. So I'd love you to think about the fact that you're literally, you go to the zoo in Baltimore, you're literally surrounded by places that'll just give you fresh perspectives on things. And yet we don't, we have this compelling aversion. Any of you ever been competitive swimmers? Come on, isn't this the city that Michael Phelps is from? Yeah. Okay, so, but any of you ever watched competitive swimming? Any of you have any idea of the four strokes that are used in any swim competition? Butter, when, back, breast, and free there. Okay, butter, back, breast, and free. And anybody know which the fastest stroke is? Free. free. It's free style, okay, and the second fastest stroke? Butterfly. Butterfly, and there's reason to believe for about 15 to 18 meters <coughs> that a good butterfly is as fast as a freestyler. Um, anybody know what the third fastest stroke is? The backstroke and the slowest stroke used in competition is is the breaststroke. Kind of a funky stroke, but you get to keep your head out of the water. You get to see where you're going. Kick patterned after a frog, not as fast as a dolphin. Um, favorite stroke of 95-year-old German women in the Baltic Sea. Okay, so it's a really interesting stroke. Okay. So the reason I ask you about swim strokes, I've been a swim referee. Our kids are all swimmers, and I used to swim, but just for fun. Um, and I've been a swim referee for 14 years and got curious, hanging out at all these meets, about who invented these swim strokes. And so I decided to investigate. And what I found was this really interesting fact, and that was in the 1800s, there was only one place in the world in which they cared about competitive swimming, and that was Northern Europe. And whenever the water got warm enough, about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, they would hold a swim meet. And all the leading swimmers from across Northern Europe would show up. They'd come from the Nordic countries and the British Isles, France, Germany, uh, Holland, um, they come from Belgium, even from Spain, and they gather for swimming. So a big swim meet's being held in London, England in 1844, and just before the swim meet begins, two visitors show up from South America. They'd never been in a swim meet before, but they heard a big swimming event was going on at the lake, and could they participate? The host, eager to show people from a distant land how well they swam, said, that would be great, we're delighted to have you get the mood here. My best swimming goggles on. Okay. The guest said, simply tell us what we need to do and we're eager to participate. The host said, it's really very simple. We're going to have a number of races. The races will be varying lengths. We'll start at the bank. We'll go out to a marker in the lake. We'll either just come back once or we'll come back any number of times. We'll explain that to you. First person to get around the marker and then come back to the bank is declared the winner. I'll say, swimmers, take your mark. Our swimmers will get down. If you want to, you can do that. You don't have to. Then I'll fire a gun. It'll be a blank. Don't worry. Up in the air. That will begin the race. They said, that's easy enough? They got ready. Swimmers, take your mark. The visitors looked down the line, saw people get down. They got down and ready. <laughs> the gun went off. They all dove in the water. And within a few seconds, it was clear to the huge crowd that had gathered that these folks did not exactly know how to swim. Because within a few seconds, they were way ahead of all the local northern European swimmers. It's kind of a weird thing. People kept watching them. And then as they got to the halfway mark, they were really far ahead. The host and all the people gathered said, don't worry, that's OK. They swim a really weird stroke. They'll get exhausted. They'll never make it to the bay. But at the end of the first race, they were twice as far ahead. It turns out in the 1840s, the only stroke that northern Europeans had figured out how to swim was the breaststroke, the slowest stroke known to human beings. The only stroke that the, that the guests knew how to swim was the freestyle, the fastest stroke known to human beings. At the end of the first race, the host looked at the guests and said, you might be tired, don't worry, you can take a break. The, the guests said, no, actually, we're not very tired at all. Swimming is fun. We'd like to enter another race. <clears throat> they won every single race they entered. At the end of the meet, one might have imagined that the host, having seen a faster way to swim, might have said to the visitors, could you stay a little while longer and teach us? But instead, they gave them their medals, wished them well, sent them on their way, and then huddled to try and figure out how to swim the breaststroke faster. So that the <laughs> next time these people came, they would kick their butts. This went on for 29 years. For the next 29 years, Northern Europeans tried to figure out how to perfect the breaststroke to make it faster. Then in 1873, a young man named John Trudgeon who was, became the coach of a leading London swim club, never seen anyone swim the freestyle, but had heard about it from an older member of the club, decided to go and find people who could teach him. 
he went to South America and in the Amazon found people who swam the freestyle. He asked them to teach them how they swam. He took detailed notes of everything they did, stayed till he perfected the stroke, notes that are now in a museum in London, came back and taught his young charges how to swim the freestyle. The first race they entered, they won every single race. Now, Northern Europeans, having seen other Northern Europeans swimming the freestyle, decided that was cool and the world of professional and organized swimming was changed forever. The most interesting fact about the world of swimming is the following. We now know in every part of the world except Northern Europe, in South America, in North America, in Africa, in South Asia, East Asia, Australia, and the islands of the Pacific, people have been swimming a variation of the freestyle for 10,000 years. The only place they cared about competitive swimming was the only place they had no idea how to swim fast. <laughs> so I'll leave you with this simple idea, and that is almost all of us every day go to work and swim our variation of the breaststroke because we're comfortable with it and because the people around us, the friends and colleagues around us, swim it really well and help us to get even better at it. And if we continue to behave like that, we'll continue to be incrementally better. But if we're open to the possibility that somewhere on Earth, a stranger knows something we don't know, that could dramatically change the way we look at what we do and the value we deliver to customers, we can be way more compelling than we've ever been before. <coughs> and so the issue is, do we want to keep swimming the same way, or do we want to learn some new and powerful strokes? And if we do, there's actually a simple way to make that happen by like getting up and opening our eyes and believing that any other person on earth could teach us something that we would benefit from knowing. Each day we pass by 100 people who could change our lives. The challenge for each of us is how many of them will we engage and how open are we to learning the things they know best. So I appreciate the chance to be here. I'd love to kind of answer any questions or talk with you. I'll be here to sign books. Again, the book comes with an unconditional guarantee of satisfaction. Um, and the book is really about how you and everyone in your organization can really connect with strangers in powerful ways, figure out what your gaps are, and challenge yourself to be more remarkable than you ever imagined possible. So thanks for inviting me. Thank you. We're a little past schedule, but if anybody has one or two quick questions, Alan can answer them. If not, he'll be over here to say <coughs> Anybody have any questions? Thank you all for being here. Happy holidays.